Welcome to New York Got Game, Boom Shakalaka. Another week, another playoff edition of New York Got Game, and this week we are coming to you after the Knicks' huge Game 4 win in Philadelphia with an all-time performance by Jalen Brunson to give the Knicks a 3-1 lead in their series with the Sixers. So much to get into this week with my special guest, so let's get right into it. The Knicks are heating up. Okay, so following the Knicks' 97-92 victory over the Sixers in Game 4 down in the city your brotherly love, the Knickerbockers, they are now just one win away from their second straight second-round appearance. So, we're going to talk some Knicks hoops, and joining me to talk about Game 4 and look ahead to Game 5 on Tuesday night is one of the best voices in New York Sports Talk Radio, a host for 98.7 ESPN Radio, my guy, Ty Butler. Ty, what's going on, man? Good to be here, man. Good to be here. Glad to have you here. We've done some other videos. You're on the Rapid Rundown. Now you're sure. here from New York Got Game. Look, this game for the Knicks on Sunday, game four. It was a wild ride for the fans. What were your quick thoughts on the game as you were watching it and taking it? And what were the quick thoughts you had about the game? Well, I, I felt like I was watching the best performance as far as, you know, Knicks franchise history by an individual player with Jalen Brunson. And it happened in a game where you figure they were that close to this series being tied 2-2. Right. So when you put that all together, you know, the Knicks with Jalen Brunson were saved from, you know, a, a must-win situation returning home in Game 5 with the series all of a sudden shifting in momentum. That was an incredible performance by Jalen Brunson. And that crowd, man, the Knicks fans traveled down to Philadelphia. It felt like a Knicks home game yeah. uh, down the turnpike. So uh, that's a huge win. And now they're on the cusp of uh, ending this series in, in five games if they can get it done on Tuesday. And we're going to get into all of that. And it was a huge win. And you definitely heard the Knicks fans down there in the city of brotherly love making their voices heard right there. But, Ty, we got to tip things off by talking about Jalen Brunson, who you just mentioned. Folks, Jalen Brunson scored a Knicks playoff record 47 points in game four. So I got to ask you this, what does this performance say in what I would call the growing legend of the Knicks point guard that is Jalen Brunson? What does this performance say about him? I would say that's maybe the difference between the Knicks getting bounced in round one versus them possibly getting to a conference finals because Brunson in the midst of all the adversity, we talk about the officiating, we talk about what Embiid has done. This guy said, you know what, we're not going to get dirty. We're not going to get bogged down in all the headlines and all the hoopla. What I'm going to do is what I've been doing all season long, and that is when our backs are against the wall, I play my best games of basketball. And what did he do? 47 points. That's a playoff career high for him. That's a franchise record for the Knicks. 40 and 10. Never been done before by a Knick. So he put the team on his back, and it was that close to them getting either bounced in round one versus them possibly getting to a conference finals. So when you talk about legend, playoffs, postseason, that's where legends are born, and Brunson continues to put on a, an absolute show for the Knicks. Yeah, the legend is growing, and he did it here with his playoff career high, as you mentioned, Knicks franchise record with the 47 points in the playoffs. Never seen that before. Knicks fans haven't seen that before. One of the great playoff performances in Knicks history. Now, look, you can talk about Jalen Brunson. We had to talk about him off the top. But you can't talk about this without talking about the role players Absolutely. of the Knicks, Ty. How crucial were the contributions from OG Ananobi, Josh Hart, and there were others in this game for victory, but how big were those contributions? So we can start with Josh Hart, who obviously didn't play his best game. He was averaging 21 points a game coming into this. His shot wasn't going, but he was still on the board. He was still playing impactful defense. OG Ananobi, man, it's hard to argue against this being the single most impactful game he's had since being in the Nick uniform. When you look at just the fourth quarter alone, Joel Embiid, who had been dominating in this series, dominating in this game, was 0 of 5 in that fourth quarter for just one point and OG Ananobi was forced to guard him and that put the Knicks in great position to d defend him better than they had the entire series. And Deuce McBride, man, what can you say about him? Sometimes it's not the, the amount of shots you make, it's when they actually go in. So he hits three threes and you can just sneeze at that but they felt like momentum threes. Anytime the Sixers were pulling away, he hits a big shot. So Deuce McBride shows up, OG shows up, and then pressure Jachua on his, you know, his defense late in the game was crucial for the Knicks as well. Yeah, he was. Those three were absolutely tremendous in terms of the Knicks getting this win. And you talked about the big shot making of McBride, but when you talk about this victory too, you cannot talk about the defense. The defense, they were, it was stifling in this context. The Knicks held the Sixers to 90 Two points overall, Sixers star Joel Embiid, he only scored one point 
in the fourth quarter. So, Ty, what did the Knickerbockers do differently on the defensive end in this game in particular after what we saw from them in game three? Now, it was kind of a blessing and a curse because if you're a Knicks fan, you're watching that third quarter where Hartenstein picks up five fouls on Joel Embiid in one quarter. I don't can't remember the last time we've seen that. He had zero fouls the entire game, five in one quarter against Embiid. So you're watching that, you're frustrated because it's like, here we go again, Embiid's marching to the free throw line, picking up easy points. But it ended up kind of being a blessing in disguise because he clearly couldn't guard him. Then uh, Thibodeau makes the adjustment to throw OG on an OB on him. And OG's fronting him, and then he's getting backside help. So I think that they locked in and made key adjustments. Hartenstein never returned to the game. So you allow Precious to stay in, OG to guard him. And then, again, we mentioned Deuce McBride, who played some, some pivotal minutes. But, you know, the defense, remember, like all we say about Brunson and DiVincenzo, the calling card for this team is defense. Tom Thibodeau is a defensive-minded head coach, so when the game is on the line, when a series is on the line, a chance to you know, take the series, they went to what they've known best, and that was shutting it down defensively. So you got to give them a lot of credit for that. Got to give them credit for that on the defensive end. Dominant once again, and as everyone knows, when it comes to defense, part of finishing defense is getting rebounds, right, Ty? We saw once again the Knicks, they dominated on the boards. Josh Hart in particular, 17 boards in this contest, folks. How tough are the Knicks going to be to beat if they continue to show this kind of effort on the glass? Yeah, they had 15 offensive rebounds in this game, and it was eerily similar to that series against the Cavs last year where it was possession after possession after possession that ended with the Knicks not making shots but corralling rebounds. So second and third and fourth chance opportunities, and eventually uh, Brunson, DiVincenzo, Hart, like these guys are going to make you pay. So, you know, everyone knows coming into a game against the Knicks, you got to box out. You got to be on the boards. The problem for Philadelphia is Embiid can't jump. So, it, it, like, sometimes it looks like he's not giving any effort. His knee is so messed up, he can't jump. So, when he plays 24 minutes in the second half, all 24, he's winded. He's gassed. So, the Knicks, it's a combination of them being just amazing on the boards and the fact that they're going up against a big who, who just can't get off the floor right now. You can't get off the floor right now. You saw the Knicks do what they do. Number one team in offensive rebounding throughout this season in the NBA. I want to talk about coaching adjustments because you mentioned this with Tom Thibodeau. We saw Tom Thibodeau stick with Miles McBride. Precious to to close out this game in the fourth quarter along with allowing Josh Hart. He had five fouls for most of the fourth quarter and he allowed him to stick in and do that. What do you think about Tibbs' coaching adjustments, not just in Game 4, but in this series? How have you liked how he's adjusted through the in-game moves in this series? Oh, it's, it's been incredible. And it speaks to the fact that he has created a culture in that Knicks locker room where guys really don't care about the amount of minutes they're playing, who's starting or finishing games. All they want to do is win. Because we were at that press conference at the end of Game 2. Yeah. And Jalen Brunson was asked a question about his struggles. He had been 16 of 55 uh, at the conclusion of the first two games. And he said to us and the reporters there, I got to be better and I will be better. But he's not focused about his own numbers. He just cares about winning. And that's the same with Hartenstein, who rode the bench. That's the same with any of these guys who know they're being taken out because either someone's you know, performing better or their, their head coach just feels like they get a better, a better chance to win with that guy who's on the floor. So he deserves a lot of credit, man. And the fact that he didn't end up as a finalist for the coach of the year, it's just it's pathetic. It, it's a disgrace. I, like, come on now. You're watching this team with all these injuries and, and what they're able to do against the quality basketball teams in the playoffs, and you're looking at this guy and saying he's not a finalist for Coach of the Year? That's an embarrassment. It's hard to look at what Thibodeau has done this regular season and now into the postseason with the Knicks up 3-1 in this series. hard to look at it and say this isn't one of his best coaching jobs. It's really hard to say that. So I understand when you say it's might be criminal that <laughs> he wasn't a finalist for coach of this year. One of the things that happened in this game that might be of concern to some Knicks fans is Boyan Bogdanovich. He left the game due to injury very early on, only played about 25 seconds or so. How do you think this is going to impact the Knicks moving forward in this series? Because they're already shorthanded. Mitchell Robinson did not play in game four. How does this loss of bogey off the bench impact the Knicks going forward? So I don't think it impacts them in this series necessarily because up 3-1, they have the tools needed to close out this series. It's going to be hard for Philly to emotionally rebound from this type of a loss. But I think going forward, you start to get concerned about losing guys. They ended up playing seven guys tonight uh, after the bogey injury. 
And this level of intensity in playoff basketball, once you progress through the through the postseason and you get fewer days of rest in between games, it's going to catch up to you. So that's why I think it's important uh, for the Knicks to close this out in Game 5 just because you don't want to put yourself in danger of experiencing another injury. Because you mentioned Mitchell Robinson. They missed him today. I know they won the game, but they missed him today. Bogey gives you some shooting. You're going to keep having guys dropping like flies. So I think it's important for them to get out this series as soon as possible. And that you know, starts on Tuesday night. That starts on Tuesday night. We're going to start moving on towards that and talking about Tuesday night. Before we get to all of that, Let's just look back a little at Game 4. What are the key takeaways from Game 4 that the Knicks should carry into this next game, Game 5, on Tuesday night at MSG? The biggest takeaway for me in this game is, like, they're flirting with danger. So we've now seen them play four straight games where they've trailed at some point by double digits, and they have a 3-1 and one record uh, to show for it, which tells you that they're resilient, which tells you that they have a never-quit attitude, they never die. But it's also not a recipe for success. So the emphasis has to be on them coming out stronger to start games because you don't want to continue to spot teams in the playoffs, leads, and then you got to exhaust yourself coming back. So I think that's the takeaway from this game. You don't want to continue to put yourself at a disadvantage by playing a, lack, a lackluster first quarter. Right. You always have to exert so much energy as a team trying to come back in a game, not only in the series. Know the Knicks have the 3-1 lead, but it'd be nice to see them play from ahead. I know Knicks fans would like to see that. Okay, Ty, so with the series shifting back to New York for Game 5, what should Knicks fans expect from the team, what kind of energy should they expect from the team coming out in Game 5, knowing they have an opportunity to close things out? Oh, they're going to expect that this team is going to come out cooking, rolling with a different swagger because you've just absorbed Philadelphia's best two punches in this series. Game 2, they were down. We were at the game, felt like it was over. Dante uh, Brunson hits the three-point shot. Dante DiVincenzo hits the shot. Ball game over, you're up 2-0. So then you lose game three. You're at a deficit in game four by double digits, and they still found a way to win this game because Brunson poured in 47. So they've got all the confidence. They've got all the momentum with a chance to, to really lock down this series. And I know coaches and players don't think this, but come on, let's be honest. You're watching the Bucks, You're watching the Pacers, and you're thinking – if there's no Giannis or Dame, the Bucks are going to lose that series. We can definitely beat Indiana. And you're that close to getting to a conference finals. So with everything at your disposal, with all of that working for you, you got to come out here rolling. And I think they're going to feed off the crowd because you know it's going to be bananas in there on Tuesday night. Oh, it uh, is. The Nick fan, you heard them chanting MVP for Brunson in Philadelphia. <laughs> right. So imagine what the energy is going to be like at the Garden on Tuesday night. Energy is going to be crazy. Oh, man. Oh, man. It's going to be a crazy one on Tuesday night. Game five at Madison Square Garden. Got to ask you this because any game we're talking about throughout the series, we're always talking about X factors. In the closeout game, we know what Brunson can do. We saw the 47 piece in game four. Who do you see as potential X factor or X factors for the Knicks in game five? The last time we were at the Garden, the X factor was Dante DiVincenzo. Now, since then, haven't really heard too much from him. Had, had a bit of a surge late third, early fourth quarter of this game. But this feels to me like a Dante DiVincenzo game. Shot's been off, but he's still out there grinding, still out there hustling. Um, I, I think that at some point he's going to get it going. And returning to the scene where he was just a hero just last week, this feels like a Dante DiVincenzo game to me. Feels like it should be a big spot. You're right. Didn't shoot the ball that well in game four. Did have two big threes towards the end of the third quarter. That was huge in Knicks coming back in this game. So we will see. Okay. You like the Dante DiVincenzo game. Here's the money question. Knicks are trying to close this out. What do the Knicks need to do in order to close out the series and win game five at the Garden on Tuesday night? It's more of the same. It's dominating the offensive glass as you did. I, trying to slow down Maxi and Embiid, even though you haven't really done that and you're still up 3-1. But what this all comes down to is how we started this, and you talked about the legend of Jalen Brunson. Closeout games are tough. They, they, they say the closeout game is the toughest to win in the series because emotionally, like, there's such a psychological battle. So it comes down to your best player doing best player things, and I expect Jalen Brunson to seize the moment to understand 
we got this. I'm going to take y'all to the finish line. We snatched their hearts out in game four. So let's just put the finishing touches on this five-game little gentleman sweep and get, it, get the ball rolling to round two. So the key is for Jalen Brunson to continue to be Jalen Brunson. All right, Jalen Brunson being Jalen Brunson, which Knicks fans have become very used to seeing, especially here in the playoffs in these last couple of games. Okay, Ty, here we go. Prediction time. Got to do this to everybody. Give me your prediction for game five. Do the Knicks close it out at MSG in advance, or will they be returning to Philly for game six? So the trend in this series, first quarters in game one, Sixers up nine. Uh, first quarter in game two, Sixers up seven. In game two, the Knicks had a first quarter lead, but then in this game, they were up ten. So it's trending in the direction of Philly getting off to a hot start and them not being able to close the deal. You had the heartbreaker at the end of game two. This was a gut punch at the end of game four. All of that to say it's hard to envision them being able to emotionally rebound from that devastation, from what you've watched in the first four games of this series. So I think the Knicks come out strong. That home crowd is going to be bumping. It's going to be amped in there in the garden. And I feel like they're going to close it out. I don't see, like, Philly has the talent to do it. It's just, you know this, man. You've played sports. That psychological disadvantage right. on the road against a team that snatched their heart out, I just can't see it happening. I really can't see it happening. All right, so you got this. You got the Knicks doing it. The Knicks obviously won in the first round last year yeah. in five against the Cavaliers. They didn't get to close it out at home. Now they have a chance to do it in front of their home fans. You talked about how the crowd is going to be jumping on Tuesday. Tyreek Butler, it's my man Ty, should be in the building. We both probably will be in the building for that game five. We'll see if it's as crazy as game two. Because game two was crazy. (laughs) We were both reeling at the end of that game. Like, yo, what did we just watch? (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) I hope we see something just as good or just as crazy. Appreciate you, man. Thank you for joining me here on New York Got Games. Good to have you. Anytime, man. Anytime. Good to have you. Again, check out Todd Butler and his work with ESPN 98.7 Radio. Breaking down game four, game five for the Knicks. On Tuesday night, we'll see if they can close it out and get that dub. The Knicks are on fire! Well, now it's waiting time, and we will wait and see what the Knicks do on Tuesday at MSG. Will they close out the series? Will they have to play another game? It'll all be interesting by the next time we have another episode of New York Got Game. We will know whether the Knicks are playing in the second round or not. Knicks fans, I know you're hoping they reach the second round for the second consecutive year. That does it for this edition of New York Got Game. Special thanks to my director, Joe Missali, editor, Catherine Cooper, and producer, Brian Witkowski. I'm Dexter Henry. We'll see you next time, next week on New York Got Game. And thanks for watching New York Got Game. Boom shakalaka.